So what's the bridge like? Do they got half? I mean, you cut the pine down. Yeah, we got a crew conference meeting or conference for the striking this fall. So we we'll have to do it at 10 o'clock on the call. But that doesn't matter much. So I'm actually going to go on the stage and we'll go down yeah. there. It's probably plenty of money down there. Mm -hmm. well, it's, it's probably plenty muddy down there, I would say. Yeah, hopefully it dried up a little bit, but yeah, you're right. But again, that is sticky, sticky stuff. Yeah. Todd, can I see those? No. This. Those are step increases for Bill Clark. I mean, they, they, they have been at that range for quite some time, and they just need to be bumped up to the top level. Just an oversight on that part probably should have been taken care of a long time ago. But they have more responsibility than everybody at the moment. They're the next two to decide things. Bill Bounce equipment would be about what they're going to do. He got to make decisions when I'm gone, so. Well, let's go. At least two years younger than I am, so. Make a motion that we raise Ray Daly and Bill Clark from range eight, step seven to range eight, step eight. Second. It's been moved and second. We increase Bill Clark and Ray Daly from range eight, step seven to range eight, step eight. Correct? Yep. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried.
But you know, the rental rate, I mean, Caterpillar is making oh, yeah. a little more money. But I mean, I would think that if we jumped it up to 95 or $15, an hour increase would help make it I would think closer. that would be fairly equitable. So by jumping to $15, you put a grader out there for 10 hours in a day, and it's only going to be 150 or $150 more, you know, where it usually takes you guys two or three days, or two days to build a mile of road. Yeah. So you can probably drag, if you're just going to drag, you can drag it two days, drag a township. Oh, um, no, you can't drag that south. One, you know, one grader can't drag that much a day. You usually, if you're going to do a good job dragging, you usually drag, drag a road for a mile now. Okay. Yeah. So. And, and they're all can take miles. Out of yeah. yeah. Nina, do you have any township budget numbers as far as what St. Paul and Rose Valley carried over? Um, it'd be interesting, you know, to, to see how much they're actually carrying over. Yeah. Well, I don't think I don't think I should sold them equipment the year before and they ended up like that. We should have submitted. We should have some of it. We should did, did a little more work in blocking and stuff like that on some of the roads that, that we pulled out. Yeah. I know we need I talked with uh, a couple of guys down uh, south and there's more roads we need to pull up with the song. I gave them a copy of this. Those roads that you pulled up earlier uh, seemed like it was November and shot up in November. They were pretty steep at the start, but I went down them yesterday and it's really flattened out. Yeah. All the water was in the ditches. It was uh, really nice. Well, yeah. They've really, it's amazing how much they flattened down and widened yeah. up. Yeah, they'll the widen some. I mean, the ditches are still soft. I would want the two big trucks to move because that would yeah. be an issue. I mean, just on that one. On that one yeah, but it was good and hard. Good and hard and, hard and, and wide enough. Plenty of yeah, I put that rock on that sand. Actually, it's good for blowing off. And, and hopefully, we can get some vegetation going on up here this spring. And that. So, instead of us uh, making a motion to increase it, should we allow, see if the townships want to come in and say they don't want it? Or should we just do it? What do you think? I think we're kind of in charge yeah, of our sure. equipment. I mean, what I'm worried about is, is us ending up working on a grader and then at the end of it being wore out, find out, well, well it's, it's a record attack. I mean, we were on a grader for more now than we were mm -hmm. at. Mm -hmm. But we're milling out a lot of hours oh, too. Yeah. I mean, it's just not yeah. for nothing. Yeah. But it's still, I mean, when you're talking about two hundred eighty thousand dollars for a motor grader, yeah, and two hundred ninety or one hundred ninety thousand dollars for a dump truck, and you know, other things, nothing is getting cheaper. Yeah. Do you think our dump truck rate and excavator and high motor rates are where they need to be? I usually try to go by the female rate. What, what we the FEMA was doing it. The FEMA rate is usually the rate of the equipment plus the hour that they should in for the Okay. So you think we're all right on those? So it's the greater. Pretty close. I don't know if I haven't checked it in a year or two, but that's something I can go online and check it with it and, then, and fix those accordingly. Rose Valley Township raised their contractual services from 100,000 in 2020 to 128 for 2021. Um, they are projected to carry over $61,000 into the new year. This is in their road fund, which is what Phillips services would come out of. Um, St. John, I really can't, we really can't tell any numbers until we look at their annual reports. Um, St. John Township. 
They were projected to carry over 60 some though. Mm -hmm. For as well. Mm -hmm. um, St. John only is carrying or is budgeted 74,000 for other operating expense, which is what I'm assuming yours would come out of. Were, they were at 68000 last year, they're at 74000 this year, they only carry over $4,000, so they cut theirs pretty tight. But the budget's okay. way small. They need, to, they need to raise their mail, because I would say they're probably one of the lowest budgets. Their total expenditures for the road that's on a projected at $76,000. So. But it keeps their levy in. Do you want me to just notify that that's what we're going to do, or if they get permit, just make a motion? Does it require a motion? Yeah, I would, just okay. so when they come in, they'll know it's a. Do you want to go ahead and make a motion now? Yeah, I'll make a motion that we uh, go from $80 an hour for our township greater rate to $95 an hour. I'll second that. In move and second, we increase the greater rate from $80 per hour to $95 per hour. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. Yeah, because actually it's been a while. I can't remember when we started doing this. It's been a while. Yeah. 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 Everything we've already done, I mean, I don't see how you can uh, yeah. go back and say, yeah, we're going to try to do more for that. Oh, yeah. Well, I would say, I'm now that we're going to start for purposes. So. Yeah. Yep. Before I ask. Yeah. <laughs> and this is for both temp for both counties? Um, yeah, I mean, for any. Because I mean, Phil does. He does. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, right now, we're not doing that. We're still in the succession. So that's what we're charging. I don't know. I guess I see if you're going to carry over 60000 or close. We need to make sure it's good for us as far as taking care of our, our equipment. You know, making sure it's worth it. If they're going to carry over that much. Yeah. Um, we need to for sure make, make sure it's good for us. So. I'm making a motion that we go into executive session for attorney client privilege for 15 minutes, including Nita, the commissioners, Mike. Sorry? I'm moving second. We go into executive session for a client attorney privilege on uh, 15 minutes. All in favor say aye. Aye. Yeah. Uh, motion carried. Real quick. Hi, Shannon. I'm going to go for this. Good. Good. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, so I looked this morning, but we have more calls than I was leaving. We've got roughly about 750 people on our vaccine wait list. Um, and we are calling this week to schedule people for another um, distribution again next Friday, the 12th. Um, we received 100 more doses. I am Thinking we're supposed to get another hundred, so we may be able to do another two hundred, like we did the first group. On um, our Friday. On Friday, on that Friday the twelfth. Um, I we are also going to um, so the first group of phase ones that we gave vaccines are going to get their second dose this Friday. Um, so we're going to start doing second doses beginning this week, and then next week um, the next group of ten will get their second dose. Um, they send us an email out about every week or two telling us that we're going to get another shipment of vaccine. Um, I can accept it or I can send them an email back saying we can't vaccinate more people yet and ask them to delay that shipment. 
So, so far we've been able to accept the shipment and vaccinate and not have a problem. Um, I'm able also to, um, whenever we max out capacity to be able to vaccinate, I can transfer vaccine to the pharmacy and potentially the hospital if they have the capacity to vaccinate public. I don't know if they'll want to do that. The pharmacy does want to do that and they offer. So, um, whenever we reach a capacity where we're not able to keep vaccinating, whenever we get the vaccines in, I can um, sign a form and distribute the vaccine to the pharmacy so that they can take some doses and vaccinate also. So I've been talking to Chris about it so that I know how many he can do in a day to know how many we can send to them and we can do that. So do you think we'll, since we're kind of on, going to be able to do 200 last Friday and then 200 this Friday, hopefully? Is that kind of the amount that we're going to be getting at a time? So it seems that they're shipping us 100 at a time, but I got an email on the 27th saying they're going to ship 100, and then I got an email on the 29th in the morning say they're, saying they're going to ship 100. So that's why I'm thinking we're going to have 200 again. <coughs> I just haven't gotten a shipping confirmation for that second set of 100 that they told me that we were going to receive. I got the shipping confirmation on Monday for that first email that I got, so I'm expecting another shipping confirmation maybe today. Okay. So you have 750 on the wait list for phase two, or is that's that counted? Total. That's total. That's total. I was going to say, because if we already did 200 plus 750 more, that'd be like 12 or so. Yeah. Well, yeah, but of our elderly population, that'd be quite a bit. And I mean, we have, phase two is our biggest group of people to vaccinate, and that's our elderly population. Yeah. So, and, and it also includes like our high contact workers, so like the courthouse staff that wanted it. Yeah. Um, we grouped the school in there with that because they're with the kids and we want to keep the schools open, so a lot of the teachers have already gotten their first doses. Um, Anybody that works, we did the pharmacy because they're high contacts. I mean, if they're out, then we don't have a place for people to get their prescriptions. Um, grocery store workers could come in and get it if they wanted because they're high contact. And if we don't have a grocery store, then people have to drive out of town to get groceries. So that's kind of all the phase one people that we've got. Um, and we still have people calling and getting on the list. So I mean, we, I'm saying roughly 750. And I mean, by the time I get back, we could have had 20. Yeah. Are they sending in any more? Is it just vaccine or are they sending in any? They're sending supply kits. Supplies. Yeah, so um, we kind of know when to expect the vaccine to show up because the day before the vaccine shows up, we get the supply kit. So it'll come with um, the needles and syringes. It's been coming with the alcohol prep pads. And um, if it's the first doses that we're receiving, it comes with the cards that we give to everybody. If it's a shipment of second doses, the cards won't be in there with it. So. Yeah. Well, I had several calls uh, between the clinic and yesterday uh, commending you guys on a good job with the clinic. Um, normally when we do a good job at something, people don't reach out, you know, go out of the way and tell you, you always hear about the bad stuff and all the good stuff. But I heard from three different people that you guys did an excellent job. So That's nice to have yeah. the, the compliments because a few people stopped on their way out and told us thank you if they appreciate it because they didn't. They were afraid we were going to do a drive-through style that they were not really excited about having happen. And I mean, I feel like with the small amounts that we're getting, it's easier to do it the way we're doing it, where we have groups scheduled to come in, and then it's easier for us to also keep track of who needs our second dose when. Yeah. So. Well, and they were the staff was able to accommodate those that couldn't yes. get out of the car or whatever. They ran out and took care of. Them. It just went so well. And I mean, with this group that it we're scheduling for this next time, we've got several people that aren't able to walk that far, so we've told them. We've, so I have a cell phone that we use for emergency preparedness, and we've given that number to those people so that whenever they pull up, they can just call, and then somebody can bring their form out to them, and then we'll be able to just go out and vaccinate them in their car so they don't have to walk all the way in. And then we kind of give them, um, instructions on what to do if they start to not feel well so that somebody can come out and check on them. So they stay in their park for the 15 minute wait still too. Okay. Do you, do you have to notify the state or whoever you get the vaccine from? You know, we got 200 and we gave 200. 
so that they know that the ones they're giving us we are giving out? Yes, so um, there's a state reporting system for vaccines. We use it for all of our immunizations all the time. Um, so we're putting all of the all of these vaccines into that reporting system so they know how many doses have been given. Um, it also is how we keep track of our stock that we've got in our um, vaccine refrigerator too. Um, there's a federal reporting system that I report to daily and tell them how many doses that we've got in our refrigerator also. So um, we're supposed to report the doses that we've given within 24 hours of giving them. So we did the vaccine clinic last Friday and then Saturday I came in and put those in because by the time we wrapped up it was after 5.30. Yep. So we put things away and I just came in on Saturday and Kaylee came in and we just put all those vaccines into that reporting system for the state. Will you go ahead and do the the uh, the clinics we keep doing? Did the lodge work out good for you guys? It worked really well, yeah. So it we had um, Nita came and helped with Kaylee to check people in. So we kind of set up a table at the front as they walked in. Um, a lot of people have their forms already because we posted them on the county website so they could download it and have it filled out and just bring it with them. But we did have forms there for people that weren't able to do that. So they checked in there. Um, they just made sure they had their form completed. Um, we have a temperature kiosk so we have them pick their temperature as they walk in. And then um, we have chairs in the hallway so that people could sit in case we got a lot of people at one time. And then we set up three stations in the gym to do the vaccines. And then the other half of the gym have chairs set up six feet apart for people to sit for their 15 minute wait. And um, we had somebody there that was able to monitor the people for their weight to be sure that they were feeling okay before they left. And then we had, had a table um, for them to check out at as they left to schedule their second dose. So if we got, if it keeps going more, we're just getting 200 a week. I mean, well, we've got 750, 750 people signed up now. I mean, we're looking, we'll probably have four more weeks of doing the deals on Fridays. Yeah, at least. And like I said, we still have people calling and getting on the list every day. Um, I think yesterday, gosh, I can keep count of how many, and we had at least 30, if not more people. I think they didn't realize they yeah. had to call. That's, yeah, that's my next question. Where all are we advertising? So for we this? advertise it in the newspapers yeah, and ask them to run it for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, we advertise it on Facebook. <coughs> I, I short of ever sending people a letter. I mean, and I talked to David Cutright, and he said yeah. he was going to put it on um, that yeah. local person, TV, the local TV station. Yeah. And I know a lot of people look at that for updates on. But I think now it's mostly word of mouth. Yeah. Since she's had the first one. People are talking about yes. it. I heard a radio ad yesterday, but I just, for a Barton County drive through, but I don't know that that's necessary. I mean, uh, at church on Sunday, several older folks asked me about it. I'm like, call in. Yeah. I mean, they didn't know. We've had a lot some of them thought <coughs> it would cost them. And I was like, no, just call. So, so but for phase two, you know, as long as we keep getting the shipments in that we're having, we're looking at getting phase two people vaccinated by the end of February. Right. I mean, at the rate that we're going. Yes. And um, the state has not said we have to, like, move into phases as a cohesive thing. If we get finished with phase two, we can just roll Start on into phase, phase three. three. And honestly, our phase three, four, and five is so small, we probably could get, like, just lump them together if we're getting 200 yeah. doses and just do them all. Do you think there's a possibility that nobody knows what the state's going to do, but since you guys are doing such a good job of getting the vaccines that you're getting and getting them in arms, do you think they'll up it to maybe 300 or do you they think could. we're locked in? So I had to do a survey that I, I had never heard this word until I got the survey for throughput. <laughs> so it's basically saying how many people we can vaccinate in a day. So it was basically asking how many vaccinators we had. So I put, we have an average of two. Doris came in and helped us vaccinate for this last one, and she said she would be willing to come help again. I've had several other people call and offer to um, volunteer to do things too. But, so two people vaccinating, and I said that we were vaccinating people every 15 minutes because I, just, I didn't want to say a shorter time frame until we'd actually done it and seen how it worked. So it was saying that we could vaccinate 
close to 350 people in a day. So I think that's why they're sending us 200 doses because they know that we have the capacity to vaccinate more than that. So there is a chance that we could start getting more doses if they see that we're using them consistently and not holding on to them. And I can also update that at any time too. So with the first one, we kind of scheduled it for an all day thing because we weren't sure how it was gonna run. And we scheduled everybody every 15 minutes. Well, after doing it, we noticed we could have scheduled people closer together than we had. So we found some things that we needed to tweak and do a little bit better, but it was nothing that was like overly bad. It was more of a, oh, we can handle more than we thought we could kind mm -hmm. of thing. So when we're scheduling this time, we're scheduling people every five minutes so that we don't have any lag time in there. We can keep people moving through. After we got through the first probably 30 minutes right at 8 o'clock, yeah. then it was just, it was nice. It just flowed. Yeah. But we could have gone more. Yeah. Yes. Because we had, like, it, there were some people that were showing up a little bit early for their appointment, which was fine. We just moved we just right on Friday and in. got them in and got them We didn't make them wait for their time. Yeah. Yeah. So is the Fridays, I mean, would you like to just leave them on Fridays? It no. seems to be working the best for our schedule to be able to do other services still at the health department <clears throat> and then be able to do a whole day of vaccinating, too. Because why I ask is, you know, when Phil made his request, you know, for the lodge, you know, we didn't know exactly what dates. Yeah. But I mean, if it's working on a Friday, we're having a lodge meeting Thursday, maybe mm -hmm. we should just kind of walk off every Friday for the next couple months. Yeah, because yeah. I mean, it, we do um, WIC on Wednesday, so that's out. Um, we do a lot of our family planning clinics are on Thursday mornings, because that's when our provider can come. Um, and a lot of people have been concerned about having a reaction and have like said, well, if we can do it where I can have the weekend to recover and not be off from work. Mm -hmm. That's what I was saying. So I, we've had that request a lot. So, and it really that has worked with our schedule really well to be able to just do them on Fridays too. Okay. So yeah, I mean, we're, we're fine with continuing to do them on Fridays if that's the way that you can put that in at the lodge for a request. Okay. Yeah. We'll put that in. Now, Shannon, are these county specific? Can someone from Stafford County go down to Pratt? Yes. Um, there are some counties, though, that are saying if you don't live here, we're not going to give it to you. <laughs> um, we've had people from, a lot of people from Sedgwick County call and want to get on our list. I've gotten a couple of people from Johnson County that have called and wanted to get on our list. Um, I know there are people from border counties that have had out-of-staters wanting to come and get theirs. <laughs> so, I mean, we've been told we can tell people since they don't live in our county they can't get one, but there are counties that are doing that. I mean, we have somebody that works in Martin County, they got told they couldn't get their vaccine there. I'm assuming that when people call in, you kind of look at the age and, and uh, Yes, so we get their name, we ask their age, we ask for any underlying health conditions, we ask if they work and what work they do, and then we get a phone number. And, and then that way we can figure the phase. Prior, prioritize it? Yeah. Okay. And probably out of those 750, those, there are some individuals that have signed up in, in different locations. Yes, we've had a lot of people say that they're signing up a lot of places. And we have had people call back and take their name off of the list because they've already gotten a dose elsewhere. Did so you have, have sorry, did you have a lot of no-shows on? Not a lot. Line? I think it was two. Yeah, I was going to say it was only a handful. Out of 200 people, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. really good. Yes. And I mean, we, so we, let people sign up for their next dose their, themselves so that they can schedule their own time. Mm -hmm. And that worked out really well. Hopefully we'll see them come back like they're supposed to. Um, we just figured with calling and setting up appointments for the first round of doses, it would be easier on us to not have to call everybody to come back for a second mm -hmm. time to let them schedule their own time. And we have reminder cards for them to fill out and take with them. They're just going to come into the health department and get a quick booster, though. No, we're doing, we're going to do those at the lodge also oh, okay. because we're going to do a big group still that way. 
And it's two weeks after? It's 28 days or, 20. or longer after. It just can't be before uh, the 28 days. So with these first groups of people, it fell on the very last day of this month for their 28 days. So we went ahead and just scheduled them for the very first of March. That way we knew we would have the doses in. That way we wouldn't have to call up and say, we don't have the doses, we need to change you. Yeah. So that's how we planned that one. And it, this one, the first one's kind of our planning learning experience so that we can have things set up to flow easier for the rest of them. And we've had some people call and let us know they have reactions, but they've not been adverse reactions. It's more like an immune reaction type thing. So they feel like really tired, they've had a fever, um, chills, body aches, that kind of thing. That's a normal immune response to any vaccine really. It's just, it varies person to person how their immune response is going to be. I know it's crazy to feel yucky after you get a shot, but you can take it as a good thing because you know your immune system is working really well and you're going to have some good antibodies from the vaccine. So. So you did 200 Friday, and did we do 40 or 60 before that? 60. 60. So we have 260 yes. vaccines in the county yes. right now. Okay. And we're going to start doing second doses this week okay. for those first 60. And this coming this Friday, Friday? This Friday is going to be second doses for those first group. But, we'll, but that's at the health department. But, yeah. Yeah. but will we do the, the 200 deal? Probably next time. Next time. Next time. Okay. And some of the people from the first group are going to be getting their second doses on that day at the lodge also. Okay. Since we're going to be there, we're just going to have them come and get their second dose there too. So there was a week this coming Friday, basically a week where we're not getting the vaccine. Do you think that'll be the way these vaccine clinics will be every two weeks? Or do you think it'll start coming in quicker? I don't know for sure. <laughs> it's whatever shows up. The yeah, it's whatever time they send me an email and then whatever day the vaccine shows up. I mean, whenever we get the email, we're going to start just planning to call people and start scheduling them because it seems to be that whenever I get an email a couple days later, I'll get a shipping confirmation. So, but they won't, they won't ship anything over a weekend. So if I get an email on a Friday, it's not going to be told later in the week that they're going to ship this. And the email also tells me when to expect the doses to arrive. It gives me like a three or four day time span of when they can show up. So, and our case numbers are are down. I think we've only got seven or eight active cases right now. So that's really good. Um, we do have a lot in. Quarantine, but it was because it was a younger, a younger person that tested positive and had a lot of contacts. But it was good because they gave contacts instead of not wanting to. So that that was a good thing because it helped us keep the number low rather than have a high number with a lot of people that were out and about with more contacts because testing positive. So. Um, I'm working on grants. They, I have to have grants turned in March 15th. So I'm working on those also. What will those grants cover? Um, family planning, maternal and child health, um, emergency preparedness, immunizations, mm -hmm. and our state formula. Okay. I noticed you guys got your storage unit or container in. Yes. Did Davis's get electric to it? Yes. So we've got um, the insulation in it. We've got electric run to it. Um, we've got shelving in there, and we've got a bowl. Okay. Yeah. The plan is. You're good to go. Yes. And it's really it was, it's awesome because we had closets that were crammed full that we couldn't even get into. We could walk into them. And we were able to get things out of there that needed to be in that storage unit, and we are able to use our closets again. So it's. Is that going to work good just as cold storage? Because we didn't put any heating or air in there. Is um, that going to be fine for cold yeah, storage? Yeah, everything that we got in there should be fine. Yeah. 
fine okay. for right now. We, we did put the hand sanitizer in there because we didn't have room for it because we got like five that should be freeze <laughs> but, but That shouldn't freeze anyway. No, yeah. that's, that's why I was like, it'll be fine at the end of But yeah. everything else is okay. And they put that spray form in there? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So even in the summer, yeah. I mean, I bet it won't get more than probably 85 in there. I mean, yeah. Yeah, it'll be all right. It's, it's really not bad in there right now, but it's really cold either. So, and the way he did it, we're able, we have the door cut into it, and he sprayed it in there where we're still able to open the end also for big stuff. So, okay. yeah. Good. Okay. I just wish you would got a bigger one. <laughs> I, I know. We, we filled it up really fast, like a lot faster than I thought we would. So yeah. I was like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. Mary.
what is it, White Elephant has always been this concern that uh, if the hospital is in debt, can they, uh, can, uh, will that debt fall back on the county? So I want to talk about that in a lot of detail so you all you know, have a lot of comfort with that. We talked about that before, uh, but we'll talk about it again, especially in light of the new contractual changes uh, and, and uh, where we stand with that. So I feel like we're in an even better position to bring a lot more comfort to the commissioners than, than they felt in the past with that. But I'll let Jeff talk about the 2020 financials first and then we'll get into the contract. Okay, okay. And so here, uh, you know, I'm the accountant and I can talk for hours about stuff that y'all don't want to hear. And so, so I try to be, I've been doing this for about 20 years, and so I kind of have learned to, to try to pick the things that I think are priority mm -hmm. and important and, and visit with y'all about those things. And if you've got questions, I'll be, I'll be glad to try to do what I can to answer those. Uh, but in, in the packet that you have, uh, on the top there, you have the balance sheet. And uh, in that first line, there, that's, that's probably the most important thing in any organization, no matter what you do with the rest of the, uh, the numbers of the reporting. Uh, if you've got cash, if you don't, that kind of determines uh, whether the organization can continue or not. And so Dr. Carter touched on that. Uh, the, we currently have about $5.5 million in cash. And obviously that's a lot of COVID money. And uh, the, the important number that I've been talking to the board about more recently is at some point in time this is going to go away. And at some point in time these monies are either going to be spent and they're going to be returned. So, this is just a temporary thing. And so we need to be talking about the monies that the hospital has in the bank aside from the COVID funds. And so we're the, and this is the December financial, if you, if you roll it forward to the more current today. Is the COVID money in that pipeline? Yeah, okay. the, the non-COVID money is really what I'm talking about, is uh, the non-COVID money, the hospital at, at uh, December 31, and it, it's the same amount, it's up about $1,000 if you look at it from last Friday. Uh, non COVID money, the hospital has about a million two seventy five. So about a million and a quarter. What line is that on? It's it's buried in five point five. This is more of that. So the balance of that are the COVID funds. And so in that and I'll talk and uh, it would be we probably I need to spend a little time talking about COVID funds. Uh, the federal government obviously y'all have seen it, uh, provide hospitals with uh, a considerable amount of additional funding for a variety of purposes. Uh, there was a uh, the advanced Medicare payment program. And what they did was the federal government advanced hospitals what they calculated to be their Medicare reimbursement over a six month period of time to allow them to have the cash up front alone, uh, cash up front uh, to take care of operating expenses through what they thought was going to be a COVID moment that's turned into a little bit longer. And so but, and so the, the federal government, it's about, uh, uh, let's see, they get about 2.6 million in advance Medicare payment. And so what's the way that is going to work, and I'll way back up. The way we're told that's going to work, and I, that's kind of important, I think I need to make sure we communicate that, is at this point in time, as we're, and we talked to Jason Barber, who's our uh, the partner with uh, BKD, that does our audits and cost reports. We're talking to him pretty regularly about it. Okay, what's the latest guidance on COVID? And I don't know what y'all are getting with, with the, the COVID numbers, but we are getting sparse direction as to how these funds are supposed to ultimately be used, ultimately how they're supposed to be reported, and, uh, and, and, and what's appropriate, what's inappropriate. So we're having to be kind of careful with that. And so you'll see that I'll talk about that here in the financials, that we've got a lot of money sitting on the balance sheet that we've not actually recognize on the email when we get there. Uh, just because we just don't know the appropriate presentation of that at this point. And so you know accountants are going to be conservative and so that's the path we're taking. Uh, but anyway, uh, about 2.6 in this advanced maker plan, what's going to happen is at this moment in time, about April, um, Medic Medicare said they're going to turn off the reimbursement for the services that we're providing and then we're supposed to draw down on that and then help course of eight months, uh, if that's exhausted, it'll turn it back on. If not, then you pay that back. And so that's just, that is truly just a loan. And so since they've not started drawing down on that, that's just sitting in the bank. We've not touched that. We won't touch it until they start drawing it down. That'd be a huge mistake. Unfortunately, a lot of hospitals are going to 
much more difficult financial situations they probably have to have gotten into that. And that's, that's probably, that could be a problem. We'll see the federal government may start forgiving things. I don't know. But we know that. And so there's about 2.6 million of that that's advanced Medicare payment that's not going anywhere. And so what we've got left in this cashier of the COVID money that are still to be used, that haven't, and, and let me back up, the, on, now on the other side of it, about three and a half million is what we receive uh, for use for the COVID pandemic. And that's for buying COVID supplies, that's for uh, equipping the hospital, uh, updating the hospital, um, uh, and we've even chosen to uh, pay our, all of our employees that are <coughs> in the hospital uh, more as hazard pay. And so that's appropriate use of it. And so as we're using that up, we're really putting that down. So it's at right now. Uh, there's about a million four that's unused. About 300,000 of that is dedicated to hazard pay going forward. And so really you have uncommitted available funds. Uh, COVID money is about a million two. That's really kind of what you've got now. <coughs> to be used. We're trying to figure out what's an appropriate use of it. Kind of the challenge we have is, and y'all have to look at the call time for federal and state agencies and the funds that they send out. They have strings attached to this stuff. We have to try and figure out how to use this money in a way that benefits the hospital and doesn't just stop the closet with a bunch of stuff that's never going to be touched. And so there are some really nice things that are going on. COVID being kind of us for upper respiratory uh, illness, that's kind of, you can kind of start equipping your hospital to deal with those kind of patients that you've actually not had an opportunity to do that for. So the hospital, uh, ventilators for the mechanical breathing assistance kind of help there, uh, doing some upgrades on the ER, uh, creating some rooms that are called negative pressure rooms that are isolated from the, the ventilation system for the hospital. So you've got a patient in there that is highly contagious. You can take care of them and not have to just completely figure out how to get very uh, uh, a way to try to get them out of there. We have to take care of them. And so, while COVID has been kind of this horrible event for the nation, for the hospital, it's actually provided a tool to try to do some improvements that are going to help the hospital in years to come and, and taking care of you know, non COVID patients. So, that's what, okay, so I talked, I've already talked way too long. Uh, what you've got <coughs> is uh, on cash, you've got half, five and a half million, about a million two is non COVID. Uh, going on down into the uh, lines 15, 16, and 17 on the balance sheet there, uh, just, this is where we're starting to record and identify the equipment and the things that are being done. This is almost exclusively COVID stuff. And so uh, uh, but we're, it, that's where you're going to see that. Uh, go down to liabilities, line 24. This is probably <coughs> hard to probably touch on this a little bit more in a little bit. Uh, but what you're looking at there, the accounts payable, the CPC line on 24, that's 600,000. Uh, that's current Carter invoices. Uh, there's nothing old there. We're going to we're going to get down to that here just a minute. And so, and we're keeping that current as it's moving forward. So, and uh, there are obviously this is here, and so we got some accruals built into that. But that's that's the, the status of 1231 of CPC and current outstanding invoices uh, over to the to the company. Uh, bringing it on down to tie that out, lines 34, I mean, excuse me, 38 and 39. These are new to the balance sheet. It's part of the new management agreement, uh, CPC uh, work and arrangement with the hospital that over the, the, the course, uh, what did we say on it? 17 years. Uh, seven, seven, okay. Over the course of seven years, that's possible. Over the course of seven years, uh, the hospital will repay half of the outstanding AP and uh, CPC will forgive the other half. And so what you've got here is line 38 is that portion that, that when the contract, when the new management agreement was put in place, uh, the outstanding AP was saying that for CPC was at about 7.5 million. And so the forgiveness piece is now that that line there 4.1 million and then the non-forgiveness piece is actually sitting at 2.5 million. So it's 3.4 in October, or, yeah, October when we initiated this, and it's already down to 2.5. So that 4.17, that will be that will away. Away. That's the full amount. Yeah, it'll go away over seven years, right? Mm -hmm. And so what it does, is, and and there's a, there's there's a purpose behind that is uh, for the financial reporting, you can write it off right now. 
but on the cost report, it has major implications. It is because all this cost that's built into these, this outstanding AP, has been, for the biggest part, paid by Medicare. And so we have to take some time to absorb all that over this next seven years to not hit the cost report all at one time. And so on, on the anniversary of the contract, which is actually uh, November 1st, is we'll start adjusting off a portion of that amount and there's a forgiveness schedule uh, uh, built to tell us how much each year to do. So at the end of seven years, that goes away. Now, how many percent it just goes away? And then 2.5, it actually is 3.4 million in November, it's a 2.5. We're actually on that repayment schedule. Uh, the money's been available to do what we do. Uh, we're actually about 24 months ahead of schedule on that one. So that debt is now, at a seven year term, that is now on pace to be down to about five years. So uh, the, the new management agreement, the way things are working, uh, it looks like, I, I, as best I, it, from, as I see it and as I'm watching as it's, as it's playing out over these first few months, uh, we have a mechanism to make that all uh, go away. Part of it's part of it's So that's that line of the balance sheet. And then, um, uh, and so bottom, uh, well, that's, that's, that's the balance sheet. So let's turn to the next page, if you will, the operating statement. I'll just hit some of the, the bigger pieces of that. Line nine, total gross revenue. This is patient revenue. Uh, for the year, I'm not looking at the month, I'm looking at the month, year to date numbers. Uh, for the year, uh, the hospital generated 5.2 million in uh, gross patient revenue. That's uh, up from 4.3 million. That's almost that's 900,000 dollars up from what it was the prior year. Uh, and, and I guess let me just pause too. Is we're talking about a COVID year. Uh, that is <laughs> unmatched. Uh, I, I, like I said, I've, I've been doing hospital stuff for 23 years, and this year there's nothing like it. And, uh, and so it's, it's a little difficult to try to compare years to years. Uh, this is going to be such an anomaly year that even when we get to next year, we're talking about the end of 21, if this thing kind of goes away for this thing. Uh, these are going to be years that we can compare them. Uh, they're, they're not going to compare to anything that you've seen in years past. But, but we're here and that's what we're trying to do. So that being said is even in a COVID year where if you kind of can take, your back, take yourself back to like March and April and May when everything was shutting down, everybody was scared of everything, uh, volumes went down for the hospital. Uh, but by the time we get to the end of the year, we can recover pretty substantially to where we can count. We're actually $900,000 in the schedule. So that, that's pretty nice. That, I, I, it's always good to have any business. And that, that's even, even for hospitals. Kind of, yeah, kind of, that's kind of a sad thing to say, isn't it? It's good to have more sickness. That's the account we're talking The hospital account we're talking um, But anyway, so it's $900,000 up from the prior year. I kind of an important thing, I kind of think it's always important on line 11, we talk about this is the contractual adjustments for the hospital. Um, critical access hospitals are unique compared to uh, all the other hospitals are called PPS hospitals, respective payment system hospitals. And so the way those work is you are paid a set amount based on the diagnosis, the type of care that's needed, the type of illness that the patient had. Uh, critical access hospitals are designed differently. Uh, when we created that program about 30 years ago, uh, the idea was not, we really aren't talking about financial profitability for an organization. We're really talking about making sure that patient care is available in rural or remote locations, the, the incident of critical access. And so when Medicare created that program, uh, they created a, a funding mechanism for the hospitals to get paid their costs. Um, and that went away for everybody else. And so now, as we are extended, as we spend more, our cost report becomes more and more important. And what we get paid day to day is that critical, but at the end of the year, it becomes very important. But when it comes to Medicare, because of the nature of this being a critical access hospital, uh, you see brackets on that line, on line 11, all the way across there. We're actually getting paid more than we bill, and that's by design. So Medicare pays us more for primarily screening patients, but they're at the hospital, but we put that way also. 
uh, but we get paid more. So that brings you down, you get down to like 21, your net revenue actually goes up after you've made all your contractual adjustments. Just a very unusual piece about critical access hospitals. It doesn't function like any other business you've ever been involved with. Uh, but that's a very unique piece. The rest of it kind of works like normal business would. But that's a very unusual piece. And it is honestly, it's what makes rural health care possible. It's what, it's what makes a hospital like staff or a hospital like Hamilton able to survive the point they are. And if you manage it in an effective way using uh, the rules to your favor, uh, it, there's a way to make this work. And that's what you're seeing in DC hospital right now. It's, it's actually a nice way of making it work. And then we layer on top of it, COVID and what's going on with this year. Uh, so anyway, breaking down to line 25, uh, your net revenue, so you got to adjust. I mean, the growth doesn't mean anything necessarily to make all the adjustments in the hospital world. Uh, we're still doing good, half a million dollars uh, over there on line 25, 400000 dollars more than we're the prior year. Um, as you bring it on down, the operating expenses, operating expenses are up dramatically. And that, a big piece of that is the money we're spending to cover. We have to spend the money. It's not going to generate any more revenue necessarily, but we have to spend the money. So we're spending it, so we have to record that summer. And so those expenses are being recorded. All the expenses are being captured in the operating expenses lines, primarily in labor right now. Uh, but uh, we're using it in a way we're supposed to use it. And it's being reported that way. So that's why it tends to kind of sum up the sort of financials you get down the bottom. Uh, you go down lines 49, 8 and 49. Uh, this is where we're starting to recognize some of this COVID 9. I said we've got $3.5 million for COVID 9. So far this year, we've only recognized about half a million of it. And so we've got a lot of it parked on the balance sheet until we get more clarification as to uh, how to report it. Uh, what appropriate uses are going to be, what are going to be allowed, and, uh, and then what the permit department is going to be. And so there is still a significant piece of income that we've not reported it to this point. We'll probably wait for Jason, when he comes to the audit, to give us a little more direction. He's supposed to be out here in the middle of March, and so maybe by then we'll know a little bit more. But there is an opportunity to record considerably more uh, positive the bottom line when we get there. But where we're sitting at right now, Compared to prior year, we booked uh, a $1.3 million loss, uh, and that's about $200,000 higher than the prior year. Um, on a couple more pages, the next page is the operating safety of the hospital. Really, that just mirrors what I just said on the consolidated finance of the piano. The next page is the home health. Just even break one thing to the home health. Uh, while it's a service that has great value to the community, uh, the way, uh, the way Medicare and Medicaid uh, reimburses, they, they, they squeeze, they tighten down in periods of time, they loosen up, we're now in a tightening down period, and it's becoming very difficult to profitably, cost effectively provide home services uh, in the county, but we're still doing it. And so, line 22 uh, for the year we go to $280,000. And the primary reason why is they restrict the access and the amount of encounters that a nurse or nurse aide can have with the home health, home health care. And so the, the staff spend more time away from the patient, more time on the road. And you just, it just doesn't it just doesn't work. So, but that's, it's still being done and still trying to make something happen. But the $280,000 loss in home health compared to $160,000 prior year, so it's about a $60,000 increase in the loss uh, for home health. Um, stats, I'll talk to you a little bit about stats real quick, and then all that concerns, maybe as far as all the things I've done. Uh, comparing, and this is 2020 uh, uh, on this page, 2019 is on the page behind it. You gotta give you a little comparison, I'll run down a few of those numbers. Uh, acute admissions for hospitals, so acute admissions come into play and they're important. Uh, for the year, we had 42 acute admissions compared to 48 prior years, so our acute admissions are down. Um, go down to, uh, actually on this line it says it's line uh, 326, it's skilled swing admits. Uh, we went, we're actually up 67 from uh, skilled admissions prior year 52. That's actually more important than the acute admissions. Uh, swing bed, Dr. Carter just touched on it. <laughs> the critical access hospitals, the swing bed program, 
is the highest reimbursement when it comes to Medicare and what they'll pay. They give us a cost. And, and what it, what's really nice about critical access hospitals is because we get costs, we're positioned to be able to take skilled care patients for a longer duration of time than most acute care facilities. Most acute care facilities are called emergency. Uh, once the patient's met their acute length of stay that they can justify that acute admission, they would prefer them not to be there any longer. And so critical access hospitals, if you have a good relationship with those facilities, have an opportunity uh, to be that referral site to take care of uh, the swing bed patients. And the more swing bed patients we have, the more swing bed days we have, the more costs are shifted, the more hospital costs are shifted that way, uh, that just gets to a much better place. And so uh, swing bed admits is a very nice line to see going up. And so that was one of them. Um, uh, moving down into the outpatient areas, uh, PT, uh, it's it's dance. They had to what line is it? Oh, I'm sorry. It's uh, line 331 of the treatments. Uh, uh, for the year, we've had 3,078 uh, 3, uh, evals treatments. And we do multiple things on individual patients. That's down from 3,900 in the prior year. So in that outpatient area, that's down. Uh, OT, which is line 334, is, uh, we've, it's, uh, we've gone from uh, uh, 298 up to 377, so that's an improvement. Uh, lab, or extra excuse me, that's uh, line 349, uh, has gone from 768 uh, total radiology test patients, I was going to say that, uh, to 820. So radiology is increased. That's actually kind of a good thing to do. That's nice to see that we're using the, the uh, the tools that we have available in that department uh, to be able to do testing on patients in the And then lab. Lab's gone from uh, 35,000, and that's line 351, uh, to 38,000. So lab's good. So that's a good thing, too. Um, the ER, 300, uh, three line 353 um, total patients. It's pretty steady. It's gone from 630 to 637. And then home health. Uh, they talk about home health, the challenge that you have to get out in the home to do the, uh, the visits to YouTube. On uh, 359, we had 179 patients last year. We had 112 this year. And so you just see the numbers play out, and that's what you're seeing. Um, so what I'd say is kind of recapping, at least on the volume side, um, a pretty steady year comparable to uh, 2019, even, even with the uh, dynamics we've had for this year. Uh, it's encouraging to see the increasing, it's encouraging to see the labs and the radiology, those outpatient departments increasing. Uh, the reason that piece is kind of nice one, that can tie in to your skilled nursing pretty nicely too. That's an excellent question on your skilled nursing and your nursing. Uh, but anyway, a fairly consistent year in 2019. And financially, uh, we're just dealing with the oddities of uh, COVID and enormous and, 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 and I can't say the word, uh, a significant increase in cash over the prior year. And I was actually going to try to use the words. Is a, a, a huge increase in cash over the prior year. And then we're just spending all the money to try to use that cash up. And what is it going to That's what I've got. Is that our uh, free time? So I'll jump, jump into the contract uh, a little bit. So uh, the uh, we we like to evolve a little bit. Uh, you know, a, a, a ten year agreement is, is a long time, and especially when you start an agreement with a hospital that you're not too familiar with, uh, you want to make sure periodically that you review those agreements to make sure that it's doing the best thing for the hospital, and doing the best thing for our company, and employees. And yeah, make sure everything's where it should be. You know, other areas of waste in the contract that can be cut out, other areas that uh, we need to put more resourcing into the hospital. So about uh, about a year ago, we actually a little bit before that we started internally reviewing our, our agreements, seeing how they affect the cost report, how the resourcing in the hospital was uh, was, uh, was was going, and, and what areas we needed to kind of beef up a little bit and, and pull back. On. And so. We started modeling out our agreements, meaning that we would uh, propose some changes on our agreements internally, and, and then we will work with 
the BKD to see, hey, how does this uh, impact the hospital uh, financially, cost forward, everything. So that uh, eventually we got to the point where we came to the board and said, we, we'd like to propose some changes. And, and uh, the, in, in what was, if I may have the days a little bit wrong, but uh, about uh, October, I believe it was, I think our new, new contract started on November 1st, November 1st, yeah. So in October, we met with the board uh, after we kind of discussed on several board meetings those changes. Uh, just before the board meeting, uh, I, I did a discussion with Mr. Fairchild the, the changes that we were going to make to, to make sure that we would uh, we open the commissioners in. Um, and in uh, October, uh, the board uh, voted to accept those changes after quite a lot of deliberation back and forth between uh, the, the board's council of Wichita, our, our, our attorneys, as well as BKD, just making sure that everything was uh, was perfect and uh, we almost got it. <laughs> but, uh, and then I sent a copy of that after the board meeting on 11 I sent a copy of that, those contracts over to Mr. Fairchild so that he could review those. And, and now we're going to kind of discuss the, the main parts of those changes. First of all, um, uh, my apologies. When I was having our council review the contract, uh, this contract was original. The original contract was made by Oklahoma Attorneys, and I took the opportunity to use a, a Kansas attorney and I said, "Don't just look at the change we're proposing, but let's look at the whole contract and make sure it's compliant." And, and they found that uh, actually it wasn't compliant with Kansas law because Kansas, unlike Oklahoma, has a corporate practice of medicine uh, rule. And so we really need to be all of our nursing staff and professional, uh, professional you know, licensed people need to be in a separate contract. So uh, they work with us to basically split the one contract into two contracts: the original company, and we created a new professional uh, limited liability company to uh, to do the business of those licensed people, so that we'll comply with Kansas law. So that was a good pickup by the Kansas attorneys. Um, they incorporated the along with BKD the uh, changes that we were proposing as far as uh, changing management costs. One of the big things we did is we we reviewed each of our management service lines that are charged on a monthly basis, and uh, and some of those we dropped, some of them we picked back up. Uh, but we moved managers instead of charging an hourly rate for everybody. We moved some of the managers up into our service line charges. So those service line monthly charges went up, but we were no longer charging an hourly rate for those. Those management personnel. Um, so that's so we kind of moved things around a little bit, and um, and one of the things I told them was uh, it was very important to, to maintain the, the language that identifies the community. Uh, and back it up a little bit. We don't do contracts. This has nothing to do with Stafford, but we don't do contracts that hold communities liable for uh, any debt that is owed to us. Obviously. And we put that in our contracts, um, uh, as we did with the contract here. So in other words, if we fail at, at turning a hospital around, then we, don't, we have no reports on the community. Uh, our, our success is the success of the hospitals. Um, the commissioners have had some concern with, with the, the language we had incorporated in our contracts in the beginning, and so they proposed some uh, additional language that it's been a few years, but I thought we had done a new contract that, and, and put that language in the new contract. Uh, and when I gave the most recent version of the contract power attorneys, I said, just make sure to keep that language the same. Well, that was the original contract. The changes were actually made in the addendum that I felt to get to our attorney. So I overlooked that. So long story short on that, uh, at the next board meeting, I've already presented to your attorney and, uh, and to our board members that that same language will be now that have been in this contract. So that'll be presented. So that, that's going to be addressed. It'll be the language that this, this uh, these commission, that, that, that the, the original commissioners had, had, uh, had preferred. To, as far as we're concerned, either language is fine from our standpoint, but we're very happy to incorporate the language. That's the problem that's not oversight. Um, as far as the effects of the contract, uh, there's two main effects of the, of the contract. One is ongoing fees, because that's important. Um, how the, do these changes affect the bottom line of the, of, of, of the hospital on an ongoing basis? Uh, and the other part is, that Jeff already started talking about, is the outstanding amounts, the amounts that are already owed. So as we've discussed before, one of the things we, we did with both of our hospitals in Kansas is 
if there was money owed to vendors, um, we uh, we took the hit on that. So we made sure all the vendors get caught up uh, and stay caught up, and they all, uh, with our, the exception of us. So we're the ones that have the outstanding uh, payments owed to us, uh, uh, but we want to make sure that no other vendors are outstanding. So all the other non-CPC vendors are, are current, uh, but ours was not current. Um, so the first thing we did is we looked at our service lines and our contract labor charges, and we wanted to see if we could get down the, you know, improve the bottom, bottom line of the hospital. So what we did, with those changes I kind of mentioned in the service line, uh, it resulted in uh, uh, our old contract uh, on an annual basis uh, uh, compared to the new contract, uh, it was actually $80,000 more uh, when you take into effect the annual management fees uh, and the effect that it has on the cost report, it actually, that part of it costs $80,000 more uh, per year. The changes in the contract labor, moving the people up into the buckets and everything, um, that, that's going to result in, after the cost reports and everything, uh, our modeling shows uh, $797,000 less. So that's a net improvement uh, in the bottom dollar, the bottom line of seven hundred sixteen thousand uh, dollars of, of annual improvement in the uh, uh, in this relationship. So that should significantly help. The principal, what were we got hundred thousand? Six hundred thousand. Six hundred thousand. So if you uh, a six hundred thousand dollar loss. So if you take seven hundred sixteen thousand out of that, that's actually would have been a profit. Uh, and, and those are estimates to the best of our ability and, and BKD's ability to uh, estimate how this contract impacts the, the hospital. Any questions about that? Okay. Um, the next part of it is what, and so on, on an ongoing basis, that, you know, over the term of this, that's, that's pretty impactful. But we had at the time that we signed this uh, approximately $7.6 million outstanding uh, unpaid debt. Um, so two things, as far as the county is concerned, uh, one, we kind of just want to get a hook for that. The, the old and the, the revised language in the contract says, hey, we're not going to, this is not something that, uh, that the county will ever be responsible for. No other vendor of this hospital does that. All vendors like the language in Kansas that uh, that, that suggests that there could be some recourse on the communities, that these communities that own the hospital might be responsible for vendor debt. So from your all standpoint, the fact that A, we don't have debt from other vendors because we make sure we pay it all in a kind of fashion. Uh, so there's, you know, they can't, if, if, there's, if, if the hospital doesn't owe them anything, then the county can't get on the hook. And B, uh, the money that is owed is owed to a vendor, namely us, who say that there's no recourse. So that should be uh, reassuring. Uh, and then what we did is we said we had $7.6 million. Oh, we don't like that. It doesn't look good. And you all probably don't like that either. Uh, whether you're responsible for it or not, you don't want the hospital to be in debt, and, and we don't either. So we wanted to work with the hospital on that. So we came out with a plan that will take that $7.6 million. We divided it in, into two loans, okay? Um, our goal was to make half of that go away. So the, the first loan is the loan that the hospital has to pay. And so what we did is we made the principal amount even smaller than half that because what we want to do is say, hey, we're going to charge 3% interest and we want the principal plus interest to be half of that same amount. Okay, so we were actually writing off significantly more than half of this. So the, the, uh, basically what we did is if the hospital keeps current, then they'll, let's see, then there will be uh, $376,000 of, pardon me, my lines are adding up very good. That's the, yeah, yeah, that's of the interest written off and $3.8 million uh, no, I'm sorry, $3.8 million total principal plus interest combined. The principal uh, pay will be $3.4 million and $3.8 million on the, on the interest, roughly. Um, and then there's a second loan, and the second loan, and, and the reason we did that, we just basically kind of reverse escrowed this. We said, what's half of, what's half of that $7.6 million? 
and then we figure out what the starting principle would be based on that. Uh, then the uh, other loan is the loan that's subject to forgiveness. It's also on 3 point, uh, three percent interest, but it starts at uh, four point, just under four point two million dollars uh, is where that one starts at. And as long as the hospital, you know, meets all the terms and which aren't difficult terms to meet, then it will uh, that that will all go away plus all the interest charge. So the hospital won't ever pay on this one. Uh, and and right now the hospital's already paid just under one third of the principal amount for the. The, the loan that they have to pay off. So they're already almost two years down the center of the road, and it's only been a few months. And that's only $3.8 million loan, no, the first loan? Uh, it's actually $3.4 million. Three point four 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 yeah. Three point eight in interest. Yeah. <coughs> so they pay about a million dollars? Yeah, before it's lower. Okay. Any questions about that at all? So this is something we're actually really super excited about. Um, we, we looked at each of the forgiveness periods. How does that impact the hospital? We make sure we can cash flow. Uh, we're, we're super excited to, to, to be able to do this. Uh, and our goal is uh, that our goal is at, at the end of the seven years that the hospital is free and clear. Um, uh, you know, it, it could be that you know there uh, you start accruing some some uh, some debt again. That's possible. That's possible, or we could. We could go the other way and start building up our cash reserves even better yet and keep current with all the all the all the debt so that it's all evened out. Even if it does start going, you know, if, if we start building up some accounts payable, the, the, the amount that we're writing off, the amount that the seven hundred sixteen thousand dollars of improvement on, on, on an ongoing basis uh, are going to it's, it's going to the big problem here was we took over management of a hospital that couldn't pay its employees. They couldn't afford management fees. We couldn't collect for quite a while. So that's where the big portion of that accounts payable building was in the beginning, which isn't a current problem right now. So, that's all I've got. Sounds good. Dr. Carter, would you want to talk a, a little bit about uh, physician recruitment? Yeah, physician recruitment has been very difficult. Um, uh, we have, we, we, pretty much since we started here, that was a, a major focus, is uh, is wanting to bring additional physicians, you know, into the community. When you look at the Pratt Hospital, um, that's what they've done really well. Uh, you know, they have a bigger community than ours, but their medical center is disproportionately more active than their community size. And a large part of that is because they've had uh, a good solid base of physicians, uh, the primary and specialty at their at, at their hospital for quite some time. Um, we have it, 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 we have had a diverse provider population in this community for, for several decades. So um, so that it's key to get uh, get some some provide you know new providers in here. So uh, even if you have one, it's good to have two or maybe three because people might like one more than the other. And, uh, uh, and and if you don't have that, I don't know if you have too much about this, you understand that we need some dots. Um, we have uh, put offers out as much as $400,000 a year for dots. Um, we picked one up in Hamilton, uh, but not here yet. Uh, we have had interest. Uh, there have been some physicians willing to come here, but uh, we didn't feel that they were good fits uh, for what we're offering. We had a really nice doc that uh, that was interested that came a couple times, and uh, but it was kind of nearing the end of his career, and just felt that more of a broad range of practice that we have at our hospital wasn't going to going to fit his, what, what he was looking for. So it's hard to find physicians in the first place that practice really. Um training in, in, in you know usually you look at internal medicine, peds, or family practice. When you look at med peds physicians, they tend to practice at larger health at larger facilities. You know, they do a lot of inpatient medicine, so they don't. It's pretty uncommon to see them work in rural locations, even though they're well equipped to do that. Family practice traditionally was trained to work in this environment, but unfortunately, um, over the past at least decade, maybe two, uh, I've seen that the training for most of the family practice uh, residencies has been uh, not so. 
involved in the rural community. Uh, it's more for you know, the practice in the urban centers, and 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 uh, and it's just you don't see those positions that are as interested going to rural anymore, and you don't see them as equipped as they used to be to go to, to rural locations. So there's a lot less stocks. And on top of COVID now, uh, you know, nurses and doctors are being paid a lot more at larger facilities. Um, and even when we throw the money down there, it's been hard to recruit positions. So uh, we just hired a new recruiter um, that started with us, who's uh, I'm hopeful that she can get some innovative ideas going on to, to get new jobs, but we'll keep on posted if we, if we get some. But we'll make sure that we get the right person. And in the meantime, we have a great group, group of most of the med feed stocks that are, are helping provide the telemedicine and support uh, directly to, to, for each of our supervisors and uh, for each of our uh, mental providers. And so we do have a song based on mental providers that have been here for a while. Sounds good. <laughs> All right, any questions? So, all right, I appreciate it. And I promise you, our, this is, it's, we have a new uh, kind of commissioner and a uh, new contract and a uh, new year. And so, we're we'll talking about this time. Usually, we'll, we'll spend some time unless you want to questions. So, uh, we we'll just try to, we'll try to come in about four times a year, three, four times a year to make sure you all are today. And uh, we'll try to come once before we have our budget for us. So, uh, Boy, your hospital board meetings are third Monday. that. First, third, third, so the next one will be the 15th. Okay. Sounds If you let us know, yep. we'll be here. They'll be hate. You'll be hate. If they let you know, you'll be hate. Yeah. will be happy. If you want to eat supper, we'll be glad to do that. So. Can you start at 5? 5.30 is when they eat, but the meeting is at 6. Thank you all. Thank you. 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 My brakes aren't working. Uh, <laughs> anything else? Yeah, we've got to do the minutes. And then you can adjourn that. Yeah. I make a motion that we approve the minutes of the January 27th, 2021 meeting. Second. Then move and second we adopt the minutes of January 27th. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion carried. Um, we're going to have an executive session for non-elected personnel for five minutes and then after that we will adjourn. Carol? Is that a motion? Yes. Second. Then move in second. We're going to executive session for non elected personnel for five minutes and then we'll adjourn afterwards. Does All Mike in favor say aye. Aye. Motion carried.